Hi everyone, this meeting's being recorded. It's Angela. Hello. Hey. Hi. I got carried away baking chocolate chip cookies. Oh my goodness. I love your chocolate chip cookies. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> There'll be some at the gallery opening tomorrow for Jim Barnhill stuff in town hall. So there are tons of people in the attendee room. Right. And That's good to hear. I'm going to make Anna the co-host and mm -hmm. Shalini the host. Mm -hmm. And um, we can ask people to raise their hands and we can bring them in and promote them as panelists if you'd like. Yeah, that would be great. So Adrian and Alice and Bob and Erica and George and John, if you'd like to come into the panelist room, that means that you will be seen on the Zoom recording um, and you will be able to speak without raising your hand, although I'm not setting the rules for this district meeting. And that's up to your count to <laughs> our our counselors. Yeah. You oh, always yeah. can keep your camera off and then you don't um typically well you wouldn't show up because your camera's off. Hi Bob. Hey Bob, welcome. I look so red in this this lighting. I know. So again, if you're in the attendee room and you'd like to come into the panelist room, just raise your hand and one of the counselors will bring you in. Oh, great. Actually, we would love for everyone to just come in and you can always leave your camera off because that way, we, you know, this this is an opportunity for us to have honest conversations, to really be able to see each other and listen and talk to each other. So I really would love for everyone to just join us in if you're comfortable. Thank you. I see a few more hands coming up. Yay. And again, we've already pressed record on this. So this meeting will be uploaded to the Town of Amherst YouTube channel. And at this time, I would like to recognize our two counselors from District 5, Anna and Shalini, and turn this meeting over to them. Thank you, Angela. Thank sure. You so much. Um, so John and Adrian, I sent you uh, panelist requests. Um, that would, if you'll have to uh, select to join as a panelist, if you'd like to do that. Um, and there we go. Okay. Hi, everybody. Um, happy day of the week, is it? It's Thursday. Happy Thursday. I think Shalini and I are both coming from like long, long meetings. And so we are... Um, I, I guess I'll speak for myself. I'm a little bit like, okay, here we are. Um, but thank you all so much for, for joining us today. And uh, I also want to take a minute, one, to thank Angela for setting this up for us, but two, to also welcome Councillor-elect Bob Hegner, who will be serving with me in the coming term. Um, so thank you, Bob, for preemptively for your service. And um, I also want to take a moment, and I know I just grabbed the microphone, because I also really want to take a moment to thank Shalini for her service the past two terms on the council. Um, I think we've we've all learned a lot from you and um, have really appreciated your um, your approach and your um, your input throughout these these past gosh five years, which is wild. Well, I've only been there for two thank of them, you. but I watched the first three. Um, so yeah, thank you, Shalini, for that. And I'm going to turn thank it over you. to you to kick us off, if you like. Yeah, thank you. I also want to welcome George Ryan because of. Oh yeah, hi, this George. district being divided in a way that we may have some district three mm -hmm. residents here. So I did end, uh, invite George Ryan and Hala as well so that everyone can meet everyone. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, yeah, and again, you know, this is an informal meeting time. We have certain topics that we, we put out as an agenda so that uh, this you get to know what we're working on, what's on our minds, and at the same time, really most importantly, it's an opportunity for you to ask questions, for us to go back and forth, which we're not able to do in town council meetings. 
And so um, we will go ahead and talk about things. And again, we also want to just emphasize this is a safe space, uh, a non-judging space. So no question is a bad question. And so please feel free to ask away, to share your thoughts, and uh, we want your input. Uh, in terms of the agenda, we sort of crafted a rough agenda that I'd shared in the newsletter in terms of just talking about the budget process and the town manager goals. If you all wanted to give input on that, uh, we just have the bond authorization for the Jones Library as an agenda item, if anyone has any questions about that. And we actually have Anna and uh, Bob who are on the finance committee. And we also have Kent uh, who has been working really hard to generate uh, support, financial support for this project. So if people have questions about any of that, we have a lot of knowledgeable people here today. And um, we can talk about proposed, uh, you know, I have proposed uh, with Zero Waste Amherst and along with Alicia Walker and, and Andy and Jennifer Taub, the Universal Composting Bylaw, if anyone wants to know about that, where we are and uh, what's happening with that. Plus I've initiated, before I leave, um, proposed, it's a legislative guide, a legislative process guide, which I would love to get people's input. And we also wanna talk, share the vacancies in our town boards and committees, if anyone is interested in knowing uh, what are ways you can participate. Um, Anna, did you wanna to add to the... Nope. So my my pieces today are um, I'm going to talk to you a bit about where we are in the budget process um, with and Bob, I hope you, you'll contribute as well. Um, Bob has served on the finance committee longer than I have. So uh, has has a lot of wisdom there. Right. Yeah. Um, and um, and then we'll talk about the kind of some of the annual prep. <laughs> excuse me. I'm navigating some lasting asthma impacts that make me start coughing randomly. So I apologize if I uh, start doing that. But um, we'll also talk about where we are in the setting the town manager goals and why that matters. Um, it's one of the it's one of the most important things that we do, honestly, in my opinion, on the council. So we'll um, we'll talk through that. But Chalani, would it make sense to give? Uh, where, do you have a spot you'd like us to start specifically? No, and I I mean I think before we jump in, I just want to get a sense from the people who are here. Is there mm -hmm. anything that you would really really want? to hear or get clarifications or talk about before we get on with what we want to talk about. Any burning issues that you have questions about? All right. We've named yeah. all of them and so we're ready to just, just jump in. Yeah, so I'm gonna just go for it then. Okay, and, so- and since, Yeah, and since there's just few of us, just raise your hand and if you have a question in the middle of what we're saying or just stop us anytime. Okay. Yeah, feel free to interrupt me at any point. Um, so we are in the, in the, I'd say beginning to mid stages of a couple really important processes uh, for how we plan for the future of our town. Um, the first is setting the goals for the town manager. This is something the council does every year. And these goals really help us to, they're the policy goals for the town manager. As you know, the town council is the legislative branch of our government. And so um, we don't set necessarily like executive department goals, but we think about what policies we would need the town manager su support and where we'd like to see action from him in the coming year. Um, in the past, uh, this has been a long process this year it will continue to be a long process and as we're still a relatively new form of government we're still also trying to figure out what is the best way to do this so our governance committee gol is um is dealing with this right now in terms of how do we make sure these goals are broad enough that we have flexibility to address things that pop up during the year things come up all the time and if we set really prescriptive goals for the town manager that fill up his entire calendar and bandwidth we're not giving any latitude for something that might be important to do, but we didn't know about a year ahead of time. So GOL right now <laughs> is navigating this kind of, where do we zoom in? Where do we zoom out? How do we make sure that we're being specific so that we have things that we can say, yes, you did this because we use the goals to uh, write the town manager evaluation. So how do we be specific enough that there are you know, if there are specific things that we want done, that they are able to be reflected in that. 
but broad enough that we give ourselves some flexibility in terms of uh, addressing things as they come. Um, <laughs> excuse me. So that's goals. I'm going to pause there to see if any clarifying questions come up. Um, the second piece that we are delving into is the budget cycle. The budget cycle never ends, right? There's always something throughout the year, but the part of the process that we're at right now is developing the financial guidelines. And similar to the goals, this is essentially the really big picture look at how we want our money to be spent. So for example, um, typically we've always done the same increase, percentage increase for each department. Is that something we're going to continue this year? Likely the answer to that question is going to be yes, um, but it's, it's important to discuss it every year because you never know when there's going to be an emergent need. And to that end, as we're creating these financial guidelines, we'll also meet, we have a four towns meeting coming up um, and that will be um, with, the, with the area towns to think about the services that we share, for example, the regional schools, what are the, the budgetary needs there as we kind of have to fold in all of these different elements into our budget process. So the budget guidelines, um, I'm going to say it's a, <laughs> it's a fascinating read, but I recognize that my definition of fascinating doesn't always translate to other people's. Um, so it really does help support and give that guidance on the to the town manager on what we want the budget to look like. Please note, there are a couple of really important things to know about the town council's role in the budget. We can't tell the town manager to direct a specific amount of funds to this program, right? That's not our role. Um, our role is to say these are our priority areas. He needs to give us a balance. We want a balanced budget. That's what we want him to give to us. Uh, legally, <clears throat> we cannot move, we cannot reallocate or add money within the budget that the town manager eventually does give to us. We can cut, but we can't say where that cut money would go. Um, and so the financial guidelines are, are really critical because they are our chance to say, you know, we see this emergent need. Um, for example, recently a really emergent need for us has been um, has been infrastructure, right? We know that we know that both capital projects and roads and sidewalks need uh, there's deferred maintenance, and so that's been something that's been reflected in our budget guidelines, um, financial guidelines. Sorry, I'm using those interchangeably. So that's the that's sort of the gist of it. Um, this is a really great time to give input to us, uh, your counselors, to the town manager on where you'd like to see the budget go. It's developed over the course of the year and um, ultimately we'll come back to the next council in May. Uh, yeah, in May, um, 2024. Yeah, I think I'll pause there because I know it's a lot of information, but thinking about this as a cycle, um, that's where we're at. We also We'll be confirming the same tax rates uh, or that we have had for the past um, many, many years, which is that we have the same commercial and residential tax rate. So we're navigating things like that, which is also impacts our budget, obviously, as we go forward. Anna, Question? did you want to share the timeline? I have it open in front of me. Um, sure. Could you do you may yeah. I share your screen? <laughs> yeah, I can just share Thank screen. You. So this gives a, a glimpse at what the cycle looks like. It's not necessarily organized into the cycle, but it gives you an idea of where we're at at different points in the uh, in the process. So we are uh, currently in the middle of the CPA um, the CPA proposal process. So Community Preservation Act. For those who aren't familiar, it's a pretty incredible um, opt-in law that towns adopted. We adopted it and. Um, it gives funding for specific areas of town that um, might need some support and might not otherwise have those avenues. For example, historic preservation, recreation, and open space um, and affordable housing are all in there uh, as, as categories. I served on the CPA committee for a while, 10 out of 10 would recommend. They do have resident member spots. So if you're looking for a way to engage, mm -hmm. that's personally a favorite. Um, the where we're at now is that we've begun the budget guidelines development and we've had the public forum on the budget, um, but we are going to then adopt those guidelines. And this basically is saying to the town manager, here's the here's the rails, create your budget within those, please. Um, and he's got the next five months to to um, to create something and bring it back. We will vote on CPA prior to that um, prior to that budget. 
The other really important part of this is the uh, Joint Capital Planning Committee, which will begin meeting in the spring. This is a council committee as well as it include, also includes members from the Jones Library Board of Trustees and the school committee. Um, and the, this committee really is focusing on the capital needs of the town. So also a really fascinating committee to pay attention to. And the reason I wanted to highlight it is that the Joint Capital Planning Committee also has a process for resident requests. Um, and it's one that we've been really working on. Sean Mangano, our former finance director, and I worked pretty closely on developing a better process for these resident proposals. Um, folks can submit individual proposals for capital needs that they see as pressing for the town. Um, typically, there's a smaller, uh, smaller needs, not so small. I was reminded when I was before I was a counselor that uh, me wanting <laughs> on deck chairs and picnic tables on the on Fiddler's Green on the South Amherst Common was too small. Um, but I would just like to point out they are now there, so I'm pleased with that. So something a little bit bigger than that. Um, in the past, folks have submitted uh, uh, resident funding requests for things like sidewalk repairs um, or, or other building repairs. So keep an eye on that if there is a capital need that you see that isn't necessarily reflected, but that you believe the community would would be in support of. Um, so yeah, you, the the kind of the rest of this sort of flows in a pretty logical way, right? We we receive the library budgets and the school budgets, um, and we we do hearings on all of those. But ultimately, not after the the guidelines happen, we kind of give the town manager the time until spring to develop the budget. In the spring, it starts to hit pretty heavy. Um, I'm not going to go into depth on that necessarily right now because we'll have other district meetings where we can, but. Uh, right now is is a really good time to give input on those budget guidelines. Shalini, I think that's all for me right now. If there are any questions, I'm happy to take them. Adrian, I'm gonna try to promote you. Maybe. Oh, Bob has yours. Yeah, I just wanted to. Mm -hmm. I, I'm yeah, I just wanted to add a couple of things to what what Anna said, and I, I think Anna did a great job of summarizing a very complicated process. <laughs> um, mm -hmm. But um, one of the principles that we as the Finance Committee have adopted is that we will not we will not use overrides to fund the operations of the town. Mm -hmm. So uh, a lot of towns around will say, oh, we need more money. So they're going to we'll do we'll do a, a, a an, an override and they'll raise the taxes a certain amount, each, you know, 5%, 6% in one year, and then it's 2.5% after that. Uh, we've decided that we will live within the 2.5% plus growth and try to manage within that budget. Um, now, we did, when we went for the school, we did that as a debt exclusion, which means that your base rate of taxation didn't change. It was a sort of a, you know, a... a, a a supplemental add-on, if you will, uh, that you will, will, will all pay for 20, 30, 20 25 years, uh, but it doesn't affect the base tax that you, you're paying now, the base rate on your house. So just, just that's a very important uh, principle that I think we, we, uh, we have adhered to, and I think we will continue to adhere to that as much as we can. Um, and um, the other thing is, um, I think Anna mentioned this, is the, the council um, really has very little opportunity beyond the, um, the, the guidelines to really influence the budget. Because as, as Anna mentioned, when the budget comes to us, as the finance committee first reviews it, then the council uh, reviews it and votes on it, um, we can't change. We can't change things. We cannot say, well, we'd rather spend a hundred thousand dollars over here instead of over here. So we can't. Um, and that's, I think that's state law. I don't think that's even a, a policy. Uh, so, um, so it's very important that we get the guidelines right at, at the beginning, because that's really where the finance committee and the council has the input. And where really the folks in town have the input. So now's the time to really, you know, have your voice uh, heard. Or, so 
And would you say that town manager goals is an indirect way of, you know, signaling to the town manager that this is what we want to see happen? Because that means for him, he has to divert staff time, resources to make sure that the goals we're setting out for him, he's able to then uh, work on those. Yeah, that's, I, I think that's one of the reasons why we do them at the same time um, is because we can't be putting in policy goals that are going to be hugely expensive without taking right. that into consideration when we're doing the financial guidelines. Um, right. We can't say, you know, policy goal, we want you to create 17 new departments and we don't want you to change anything with the budgets, you know? So um, right. that's an extreme example, but they do need to, they, they do play together and impact one another. Um, I think actually right. waste taller could be a good example of this, right? Is that we're, yeah. we want to move something forward that's that could be really great for our community. And we also need to make sure that we're recognizing potential cost impacts and, and giving latitude, not necessarily the financial guidelines don't get so into detail like that. Mm -hmm. But for example, last year's financial guidelines were very clear that this probably isn't the year for new programs or policies. And so we, it's, it's a bit unfair of us as a council, and this is my opinion, everything tonight mm -hmm. is my opinion. Uh, it's a bit mm -hmm. unfair of us as a council to say, we want you to enact this new program, knowing it might call, it might have financial implications. And yet our mm -hmm. financial guidelines told you to not add any new programs that might cost money. So we need to make right. sure that they're not um, contradictory to, to each other. Yeah. And actually that would be, we'll come back to that because that is the legislative process that I'm proposing is a way for the council to talk about the new initiatives because we want to encourage councilors to come up with new initiatives, whether it's a new bylaw or an amendment and be able to have that conversation and council how to prioritize it based on the existing goals we've set, but also if it's not in the goals, uh, you know, whether it's urgent, whether it's critical, and when should when and how should we prioritize that? So that's a conversation for later, but I see Erica's hand up. So Erica, go for it. Thanks for describing the process. I appreciate it. it it's nice to know, well, I know that there have always been ways for the, you know, residents of the town to you know, weigh in on things. But I guess one of the things I'm wondering about is where does, in your mind, um, advocating for continued support and funding of previously unfunded uh, programs like CREST fit in? Like, this is a program that people have advocated for that I, for one, um, want to continue seeing, but that doesn't seem to have um, a clear financial future. Um, so like, is it part of this budgeting process in part of the mandate to the town manager that you would say, like, yeah, ensure that this is going to have a secure future? Yes, and I, I also want to clarify that that was something that was very clearly written into this year's budget was that CRESS is backed by the operational budget of the town. Um, they mm -hmm. have received fun grant funding in the past that has alleviated that, but in no way is CRESS reliant solely on grant funding. They are going to continue to exist because that budget is built in as a planned um, operational cost for the town. So if some for some reason they mm -hmm. don't get that DPH grant, that they've gotten in past years, the town is is covering that cost. Um, so thank for, you for what that's worth. I want to make sure that's very clear um, that Crest is is funded by the town and mm -hmm. will continue to be funded by the town. Thank you very much. Yeah, of course. Yeah, thank you for bringing that out. And that's a great. Uh, but so, yeah. sorry, sorry, if I can. But still saying that that is a value of yours in this process is still really helpful. Um, so mm -hmm. knowing that you know, I think if it's helpful to know that it is funded great. That's awesome. But it's always still helpful to hear from folks to say, I really value this. Please continue to yeah. um, That's still really helpful for, for folks mm -hmm. to hear. Yeah. And Anna, were you suggesting that Erica then send an email to the town council saying that, hey, as a priority, we would, and I would love to see that funded. Yep. So I think it would absolutely be appropriate for, because we already had the public hearing on the budget. I think that that's, that's where true. Um, I think that at this point, a, a comment, a, a public comment would be helpful. Mm -hmm. um, you also could send it to the finance committee, but I think 
the easiest way is going to be to send it to the town council um, through a public comment. Yeah, because I think there is still a lot of confusion about what is Chris, what is the role, and I, I mean, all the counselors I know of are fully supporting it. But in speaking with some people in public, I got the impression that they were wondering whether the council council is supporting it or not, and what's going on with it. So I just want to clarify that yes, the council is hundred percent behind it, and the reason for it to be going in a way that it is going in a very careful, intentional way is because it involves the safety of the Crest members of the public. And there is a process and training that has to go in terms of them being able to feel confident to, um, yeah, to, to start taking the calls that we hope they will start taking at some point. But there's a process. Uh, we are working with the Harvard uh, Policy Center. They they recruited few towns, and Amos was one of the towns that was recruited in that uh, process. So we're working with a cohort of other community responders um, in other towns. So we're learning and we're doing this, and everyone, including town managers, really committed to it. Uh, Adrian. Let me just add also, Erica, um, the Finance Committee does have a public comment period at every meeting. Uh, it's usually held early in the meeting so that people don't have to sit through, you know, an mm -hmm. hour and a half of us droning on. Um, but uh, it can, it doesn't have to be focused on whatever the particular agenda is that day. It can be focused on any issue that has financial implications for the town. So. You're most welcome to, to the, we, we meet tomorrow at one o'clock. You're most welcome to join us and, you know, just make, make a comment that you support Cress and we should fund it. Mm -hmm. And that the That'd budget guidelines. Perfectly within your budget. rights. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Adrian? Oh, you're muted. You're muted. <laughs> So hi, hi. Uh, Shalvi and Anna, my former counselors. Um, <laughs> I'm, I'm so happy that you continue to include us. Um, redistricting, I am now, along with many of my 80% neighbors, I think, uh, I am in District 3. But I have to tell you, my heart belongs in District 5 geographically <laughs> because of the valley and those of us on the southern end of town have our particular interests um, just in terms of neighborhoods. Now, with that having been said, I would love to have a very clear explanation. The Finance Committee, uh, I believe this week on Tuesday, went ahead and authorized, reauthorized a bond for the Jones Library. I would love a clear explanation as to how that does not increase the town's um the town's expenses or liability or you know fill in the blank for it i've yet to hear a clear thorough uh understandable explanation of that so i'd love to hear that tonight from anyone i've been practicing this for like three days so i think i'm gonna i'm gonna give it a go okay so first off, Thank I want to, I want Thank to start you. by saying the finance committee is not authorized to authorize anything. Um, the finance committee, sorry, my dog is making so much, I'm in my office right now and my dog has decided that she must make a lot of noise. Um, the finance committee can recommend something to the council. That is a council decision. The finance committee will not decide that. So that's point one, um, to be clear. The, the full council will vote on this. The short answer to your question is that there is a memorandum of agreement, a memorandum of understanding between the library trustees and the town and the town of Amherst that specifies the amount that the town is responsible for paying. The remainder of that is the responsibility of the library trustees. And I'm hoping that Kent will correct me if I get any of this wrong. But one of the comments that was made at finance is that we want to see an updated strengthened MOU on Monday. And that is, that is my understanding is Paul said he would get that to us. Um, just to confirm one more time in writing that what the town is responsible for is the 15.8 that was the same as the initial cost that was presented to voters. And that this, <laughs> the increase in costs will be covered by the trustees of the Jones Library 
um, or in, in one capacity or another. How they do that is up to that elected body. And I think, I guess I'm gonna insert my own opinion here, which is that I don't think the council should be making the determination for the library trustees, whether or not we think they can raise that money. They are elected by the residents, by the voters of Amherst, uh, to decide about the Jones Library Endowment, that is their job. And so, um, you know, I think for me, I, I am comfortable supporting this because there is a legal memorandum in place that, that specifies that the town is the, the body that is, um, the town is responsible for the 15.8 beyond, <laughs> excuse me, beyond that, it's the, it's re the responsibility of the, the Jones, the trustees to um, raise the funds. Shawnee or Bob, anything I got wrong? Adrian, did that answer your question? Uh, yes, I so appreciate that. And I, I am aware that it will come before the full town council. Uh, that was clear and I appreciate it. I think the ongoing question that gets very muddied mm -hmm. over neighborhood discussions, town discussions is the what if. Now, understanding that the Jones is its own entity, it's a its own building, uh, but very beloved by the entire town. Uh, if the Jones and their trustees find that they are short, the fact is it's hard for me to believe as a very long-term resident that we're going to allow the Jones to go into the red. Uh, mm -hmm. I guess that's a I guess that's my concern overall. I understand that. And I think, Ken, if you'd like to speak to any of this, I would, I'd would i welcome that input at this point. I think that my understanding is that if the trustees come up short, that they would rely on um, their endowment to, to uh, support filling that gap. Um, they, from the presentations that the council has received, seem very confident that they will be able to raise this funding based on the, the fundraising that they've done so far, which is pretty astounding. Um, to my knowledge, I don't know that we've ever seen fundraising like this in our community. Um, so I, I, um, I'm pretty blown away by it, but that's, that's my understanding of it is that they, they have that confidence in their fundraising and that their endowment is the backstop. Um, Ken, and, what- And short-term loans as well. Yeah, and, and that short-term borrowing is, is also a, a possibility um, right. for, for them as well. But Ken, yeah, if you wanted to- Ken, you muted yourself. But, um, yeah. And you're muted. You're still muted. Sorry, now there you, go. you hear me. Sorry, yes, thank you. Mm -hmm. Yes, well, the, the library trustees have a number of options, um, one of which is clearly established is to borrow some money. And uh, several, two banks, at least, have expressed a very clear interest in lending it to them. They're, uh, <laughs> they're obviously a responsible creditor, uh, and they're interested in helping out. In addition, the library has an endowment that's now $8 million. Um, obviously, any use of that endowment would impair the, the, uh, the um, contribution of that endowment to the operating expenses of the library. But if you do the math, um, you would see that whatever contribution to the library from that endowment might be lost by every imaginable possible amount uh, yes, it wouldn't be, it would be painful, but it was not in any way impair the operations of the library. Uh, even if the endowment had to supply, for example, $200,000 a year, um, the library's budget is 2.7 million. So that's amount, that's a fairly, that's a nice cut to the budget. But it's not something that nonprofits have ever seen before. And anybody who's worked for nonprofits for the last 20 years knows that that's something that could be bridged. Now, the question is, however, what, who should pay, who should decide what risk to take? And I agree with Anna. We, we think it's very clearly the, the job of the trustees to decide that. Maybe it's worth taking a short-term cut to the, to the operating budget because five years from now, we'll regret that we don't have the best library we could possibly have if we don't do that. That's a decision that the trustees are in the best position to make. And they're delegated that responsibility. They were elected <clears throat> to do that job. And I think we should let them do it. And uh, in fact, finally, <laughs> the best assurance of all is that they are responsible for that because nobody, nobody loves the library more than those six trustees, including me, by the way. But none of us 
want the library's to, uh, operations to be impaired or looking for is the long-term best interest of the library. And this project is clearly that. And I'm realizing we didn't actually introduce you in your role. Could you, uh, sorry, no, I'm sorry, sorry, that was my fault. Could you, sorry, I was, I, and here's Kent as if- It's okay, you know, I'm a former you, trustee of the library many years ago, but uh, since it, uh, 2014, I've been a member of the feasibility committee designing this project, helped uh, engineer it all the way through. <clears throat> and I'm now the co-chair of the capital campaign committee trying to raise uh, the money for this gap. And by the way, just to give you, a, a, I didn't say anything about the order of magnitude of the gap. So uh, the gap right now is about a little over $16 million, but we've already raised nine of that. And we raised it all, most all of that in the last year. So even if we raise nothing else, we can go ahead with this project without um, eviscerating the library, as some people have said. But the, uh, but the likelihood that we won't raise anything else is absolutely ridiculous. So I, I want to, Adrian, I'm, I'm happy to take other questions um, on this because I think this is actually a really good forum for this conversation to happen. Um, I think that it's it's tough to do this with 13 council members to really yeah. kind of be in a brainstorm space and and um, just answer questions really frankly uh, and, and really quickly. So if anyone has questions about this, I, I just want to name that this is a really good space to do it in. Um, yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Thank you. Any other thoughts on libraries or budgets or anything else? Oh, let me do my hand. Erica, did you? Yeah, I'm yeah, sorry. Go I ahead. kind of really raised my hand and unmute and all those things. <laughs> yeah, um, go for it. Thanks. I, um, yeah, so there's um, talk about how spending on the library will prevent the town from spending on other important uh, goals like a uh, new DPW school or you name it, right? We have a lot of capital projects in the queue. Um, and so I'm, um, I don't believe that to be true, but I think this might be a really nice place for you all to talk about um, what the reality is and how we, um, plan for how we finance um, those other those other capital projects. In addition to the beautiful library, uh, you are correct, Kent. You want to start start us off here? Well, uh, the, the the fact is that if we don't do this project, there'll be less money available for those other projects because the only alternative for the town, if it wants a library, is to spend something in the order of over twenty million dollars just to keep an operational building in the same state it is now. And that's not a pie in the sky guess. That was a professional estimate four years ago. It was 14 to $16 million. That's now been updated by professionals. And it doesn't include re remediating the discovery of asbestos that's now been found in the building, which would be covered, covered by the contingencies of the project. Uh, but wouldn't be uh, uh, wouldn't be um, covered by it would have to be added to that cost, and there would be no money from any other sources to do that. Every single one of the donors to our project so far are interested. They're motivated because this is a visionary project for this town, and they're not interested in just the repair. So basically, instead of spending fifteen point eight, the town is going to have to spend over twenty. I would say 22, 23 million just to fix the building up, a building which then would not meet any of the, the town's climate goals, which this new project building will, and it wouldn't improve any of the services. And in fact, it would make it more difficult for people to navigate and work in the library because uh, the, the present building does not in, um, uh, in, is not in compliance with the disability handicap accessibility codes. And to make it in compliance just by repairing the building would shrink the spaces available for anything other than storing books. So the other alternative is absolutely worse than the one in front of the town right now. Thank you, Ken. And I, th I think to that point, one of my challenges is that I think often we look at what's in front of us and we don't necessarily realize that doing nothing is still a choice. Um, and so in this case, not acting on this, you know, I, I, the, the grants that were received, this was one of the questions that the council had raised was, you know, 
does the money actually go away? Um, and the reality is that the way that the donors were pledging mm -hmm. and, and giving money, it does because that was it was committed to a specific project. Similarly, the grants that we received from the federal government and I believe the state as well, as well as the CPA funding through the town was for specific projects and is contingent on the renovation expansion proceeding forward. So, so the fundraising does go away and, and Kent's correct that the estimates are extremely high for, for simply making the building functional um, to where we need it to be. I think the other point with, with regards to the other projects is that we, the, the funding plan is actually proceeding the way it was intended to. Um, although the school cost us a lot more than the initial funding plan uh, intended, mm -hmm. the the fire station and the DPW are being, we have been squirreling away money and saving money. Our reserves are larger than is recommended for a town our size mm -hmm. because we've been saving money in those to pay for those more outright. The plan has been to be, has been to borrow for the library to do a debt exclusion for the school and to pay for the DPW and fire station through our reserves. Um, that is still on track. The money that we're using from the library wasn't available to those other projects, um, that we are not taking money from those other projects. And they are still moving forward at the, at, in my opinion, not a fast enough pace, but um, mm -hmm. they are moving forward. We're, we're still navigating siting concerns for DPW. Um, fire, we have tentative sites and we're trying to move forward on what it would take to make them functional for a tentative site, um, excuse me. And we're moving forward on, is that feasible? Um, Erica, I wanna appreciate you for asking this question because I think you acknowledge that you're like, I don't think this is true, but this is what I'm hearing. And so I just wanted to note, like, thank you for asking this because it is a common question that we're getting. Um, and it's really, it's a, it's a misconception. This isn't money that's available to the other projects. Um, I'm gonna let Adrian. George, George weigh in. Adrian had a hand up though first. Oh, I know. I, I wasn't sure if George was gonna um further respond. Adrian, if you have another question or if you want to clarify something as well, that's fine. Well. Oh, you muted. Yeah, let me yeah. unmute. I'll, I'll be I'll be very quick, but based okay. on what uh, I just heard too from what we hear out and about in town, mm -hmm. um, the concerns I've heard is, and uh, perhaps it's directed to Kent that the community space, the beautiful new community space in the library uh, suggests to some of in the community that that means that a youth empowerment center will be on the back burner. Now, these are issues that roil around town um, and I don't know the answer to that. Uh, there are concerns, you've likely all heard it. And so uh, let me have some thoughts about that. Where in the budget, uh, Shalini and Anna, is that Youth Empowerment Center because we do know that the DPW and the fire station is bounced at least five, perhaps seven years down the road. And with the clamor in town for that Youth Empowerment Center, at the same time, a uh, library having this big new room, that there, there are issues here that I think unfortunately makes a lot of people in town very nervous about funding for um, items that they feel is very important. It goes along with Cress, of course, and all the issues that, um, well, we all know full well. So thank you for taking that question. Yeah, I, I my thought on it is that the youth center is not, um, that, that the, the youth space in the library was always part of those library plans and that it is not intended to replace a youth empowerment center. But because we have other projects such as that you named, the fire station and DPW, um, that are a higher priority, that the youth center, uh, sorry, the, Kent, what is it called? Youth space or team room? Team space. Um, youth team space team. in the library can help, but it is not intended to be a youth empowerment center. That's my understanding. Right. Kent, is that your understanding as well? Yes, although I would, I would mm -hmm. suggest that if you'd listen to the, You've been able to attend the trustee meeting yesterday. You would have a, you would have heard an incredible report on what the library is trying to do to make it much more inclusive. There's a group working extremely mm -hmm. hard. They just developed some data that's quite revealing and gives them a lot of ideas for uh, directions to go in. This is not something that the library is unaware of. 
And yes, I don't know, I, I, it, may not, it may not be able to take the place of a youth empowerment center, but it certainly could be, uh, serve some very important functions with respect to the, uh, the community that's being, would be served by that, by that group. I think the other need that we're, we're seeing as well that comes up often is a senior center. So we do have other needs that are coming in, including the Youth Empowerment Center, a senior center, um, the roof on the police station, right? Like there are needs that are coming up quickly behind fire and DPW. But um, I believe that most, if not all of the counselors are prioritizing fire and DPW right now. Um, so I know that's not helpful in the sense of, I don't have a date <laughs> for you, right? Um, I don't have like an, a, a, a prognosis on when things might start to move on that, but it is something that was in the town manager goals and I'm racking my brain trying to remember specifically what he wrote on it. Um, because I, I, I know that it's not, it has not slipped off of anyone's radar. It's just not the right. one or two on the list, which is fire and DPW right now. So since it was not on the initial capital projects list, but it has come up with the CSWG report, that was an important area or gap that they identified. There was $500,000 that was put in to study the issue. And now the, along those lines, they have uh, recruited somebody to uh, initiate that process and to get the youth involved, get their feedback. Because one thing is to say that, oh, we need a center. But one is to really understand like we could create the center that no one shows up. And that has happened, that can happen. So I think the process that is being followed right now is to engage the youth um, and find out what are their needs. And while we figure out what this, you know, the funding for that, meanwhile, what is the programming that can be offered to them and finding the right appropriate space for the, that programming and space to be created for them. And then again, to reiterate, uh, the library youth space, teen space is not in lieu of the youth center and the money that's demarcated for the library is for the library. And if we don't use it for that, it's, we don't build a new one, we're still gonna use it for the repairs and more. So it's never that like, if you don't do the library, that money is going to go to the youth center. That's not the case, right? Um, however, I also want to acknowledge and appreciate the effort that the library has created the subcommittee. Uh, the library trustees have created a subcommittee to make the library more uh, inclusive and speak to the needs of different populations in town. George, your hand was up earlier. Um, okay, did you sorry have about that. Uh, yeah, thank you. Um, I guess two things that this conversation leads me to just observe something that I experienced over the last two months because I knocked on a lot of doors and I talked to a lot of people and I heard about senior center, senior issues, mm -hmm. heard about fire station, DPW, I heard about roads and sidewalks and potholes, um, but I did not hear anyone or no one spoke to me about the need for a youth empowerment center. So um, I personally have some thoughts about it uh, in terms of what, uh, where this stands in terms of priorities in the community itself, let alone amongst the council. So that's, but that's mm -hmm. not why I raised my hand. I actually wanted to ask mm -hmm. the two of you, um, given your, you know, five years of experience with Shawnee and two years now with, with Anna, um, with the budgeting process and what you would change about it in terms of the timeline, if anything, maybe you think the way it is, is, is the way it should be. Um, any thoughts <laughs> about um, that you'd care to share um, about uh, changes to that process? Because I know when my three years on the council, um, I came away with a feeling like this, this really could be improved. Um, I wonder if you have any thoughts on that. Bob is laughing at me because I've gone down swinging into finance committee meetings now, and uh, I have strong thoughts, George. I have strong thoughts. Sean, do you want to go first or do you want me to? No, go for it. Yeah, um, I know, please. You know, yeah. I think, George, to answer your question, I, I've i only been on finance specifically for a year, but I've been engaged in the budget process, obviously, for both years. I think for me, the biggest challenge that I have is that there is an incredible demand placed on both the finance committee and the town staff after the budget has been presented to the finance committee and the council, um, where they go through and present to us what they're doing and what their budget needs are. Um, and for me, because we as a council can't change the budget once it's been presented to us, 
it is not helpful to hear from them at that point. Um, it is, it would be more helpful to hear from them as we are developing the budget guidelines. Yeah. Um, and so for me, that's one of the biggest changes that I'd like to see. It's tough to navigate this because we don't supervise town staff. That's not our job. And that, that's very clearly in the, in the job of the town manager. And so it's kind of walking this really fine line of it's very helpful to us for us to know what the needs are and what's kind of happening on this level so that we can form our opinions with all of the information. Um, and at the same time, we're not trying to overstep and say, Paul, you need to give specifically more money to one department or another. Um, so I think that's that's one of the biggest shifts that I would make is, is changing when we hear from town staff um, in mm -hmm. order to, to actually inform the part of the process that we have um, a, 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 a control over. Um, so I think that's one. I also think that we have not done a great job of informing the public on how best to engage with the budget process and what the mm -hmm. role of the different bodies is. Um, so that's another. And then the third thing is that I really think we have an incredible opportunity with the residential um, capital requests that has not been realized. Um, it is the closest thing that we have to participatory budgeting, which mm -hmm. was a promise that was made and has not been realized. Um, and so for me, the resident capital request should be um, more clearly articulated and delineated in terms of how to get folks engaged with it and how to mm -hmm. help folks to present projects that are feasible. Uh, what we see often is people present projects that are really desperately needed, and then it kind of gets brushed off because, you know, the Joint Capital Committee says, well, that should have been under DPW's budget or that should have been under someone else's budget. So we need to we need to clarify those processes. So that's kind of my like bigger to smaller three, just my top three for now. I'll stop there. Bob, anything? No, I, I I concur with with your observations, and um, I agree that it's kind of a little frustrating to, you know, get a budget in May <laughs> on May first, uh, a town budget, and have to review it by the end of May and get a recommendation to the town council, um, and we haven't really looked seen the town budget before then. Um, and so it's 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 a little frustrating that we don't have something in between the guidelines and then when the budgets appear. The other thing is, of course, the town manager doesn't develop the library budget, doesn't develop the the actual budget for the schools. Um, and so when we when the finance committee and the council review them, they're already baked in. I mean, they're done. Um, you know, you can you can review it from the perspective of did they stay within their budget? That's about all really we can do because within what what the school decides to do with their money, we don't really the the the, the finance committee and the the town council doesn't have a lot of say in that. So so there's a little bit of a of a disconnect between um, the responsibility of the council and the actual how the budget is actually put together. And I think we should try to work uh, you know, through some of that to make the council more aware of where things are going uh, before we get to the final product. Yeah. Yeah, for example, we can't choose to raise teacher salaries or paraeducator salaries. That was a, that was, that was one thing. George, um, feel free to just. Yeah, yeah go I, ahead, it, George. I, I like what I'm hearing. It sounds like at least uh, the, the first issue is something that the finance committee could address itself. It does have some control over the process and it could um, rejigger that process, uh, assuming the town manager is willing to go along mm -hmm. so that you could get some input from town staff earlier in the process with the understanding that we don't tell them or Paul what to do. But we I've always felt that, that you know, we need to hear from them. Uh, at some point in the process where we get a sense of what their priorities are and concerns are. And as Bob pointed out, once you've got the budget in front of you, it's May. Um, it's 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 not a very nice term, but it's a kind of dog and pony show. Um, and it's it's uh, it would be nice to see if we could find a way to, to fix that. It sounds like the finance committee could perhaps take some steps in the coming year to do that, perhaps. Yep, I agree. Thank you. Uh, any other questions that folks have, or I know we're nearing eight, Shalini, anything else you wanted to talk about? Oh uh, yeah, I 
wanted to go through the process, the legislative, and it kind of ties in some of these things that we're talking about um, in terms of how the town council has been allocating its time and in ter- uh, with respect to new bylaws or amendments, like even the waste hauler, you know, uh, that was brought in and Anna brought in lighting, uh, changes to the lighting policy. So, so far, it's still a very new form of government. And one of the observations that I had, not many in the budgeting, but in terms of the process, I did have observations that one, our town staff is really overextended and feeling burnt out because all of us are super active and that's great. We have very active involved counselors. Uh, We're all bringing in our ideas that we want to see happen. And in the absence of a honest conversation with the town staff and a process to have that conversation, the, the way it has happened so far is like, let's say we have advocates in the community like Zero Waste who brought forward the waste hauler bylaw changes. And then there were three sponsors or four of us uh, who said, okay, we're interested in this. So we presented that to the town council and the town council then voted uh, to send it to the town services and outreach committee. Now, the, the question is, does the town have the staff to make the changes that, that may involve? How important is this? How urgent is this uh, by this change? Given all the other priorities that the staff is working on right now, the DPW, what they're working. So in the absence of a process, currently the process has been that town council votes generally everything that comes into a committee. And then the committee has to work with the staff. So there's a lot of time of the council committees and the staff members to work through those issues. So in the case of the waste hauler bylaw, we were fortunate to get a consultant from the Mass DEP. We got a grant and we were able to get 80 hours of Susan Waite who worked with us. And um, and then some of the sponsors then like that would be me who took an initiative and studied all the other best practices and bylaws in other towns and came forward with what, uh, how to move forward along with Andy doing his work. So all of us are working and doing this. So, but at the same time, there is no real process. We're all just kind of doing what we feel interested in and we're doing, but without any good process. So that is why I was proposing a legislative process guide. So it's not a bylaw, it's not required, but it can be a living document that A, can tell, especially new counselors, how to initiate Uh, new bylaw changes. So for example, many of us did not realize, uh, even Andy for that matter, who's been here, I'm gonna just talk about him, Uh, but me, I'll just say, okay, about me, I've been here for five years and I did not know that our uh, rules of procedure and the charter require that when a counselor is sponsoring a bylaw, it has to be in the format that it's going to be adopted. And so for me and for Andy, we were like, how can people just propose it without doing the research, without studying, uh, talking to stakeholders who is going to impact? So for example, waste hauler, I did end up, now that I know it, I just rewrote the whole bylaw because that is the way the the charter is set up. So if you want to initiate something, you have to present the bylaw in a way that it's going to be adopted. Right. So that creates a little bit of confusion now because many people think then because it's being presented, it's final and it's done. But that's not the case because we still have to work out what is it going to cost the residents? What is it going to cost the town to implement something like this? We have to talk to waste haulers, find out if this is feasible. So it's kind of there are all these different pieces that are disconnected. And therefore I worked with uh, Athena to come up with what might be a living document and a guide. And I can just quickly share the screen to show you very briefly what that process might look like. And there are three goals. Let me just show you what it is. Um, Because it also involves clarity for the sponsors, clarity for the town council, but also for the town committee, council committees how to collaborate with other town committees like the Transportation Advisory Committee or ECAC or 
CSSJC. So having a process where we the council committees is communicating and working effectively with the other town committees and given the limited resources we have as counselors, how to engage the residents. So with that, I'm gonna just share my screen. So, and I would love feedback because this is coming to town services and outreach. I've already sent it to Athena. I don't think they put it in the packet yet, but can everyone see this? So it starts with the sponsors who want to introduce an, uh, an initiative. And so there'll be a checklist basically of what to include in the memo and proposed bylaw. What, so it's like giving clarity to all counselors that, hey, this is what according to Charter Rule 8 or, rule, or Rules of Procedure, two point, whatever, this is what you need to do. But in addition to that, here is a checklist of questions that you can go through to make sure that you're giving us the background research, like what is the problem you're solving for, who is this impacting, and so forth, right? So then they send the uh, sponsor sent the memo and the proposed bylaw to the town council. And this is where the council now has a checklist of questions, how to prioritize given the criticality, criticality and urgency of the issue, town resources and council priorities, when should we prioritize this initiative before they decide to refer it to a committee. Let's say it does get sent to a committee, then what level of the committee has to decide what level of community engagement and expertise is needed, how to effectively collaborate with town boards and committees and community partners like the Amherst College. We have Sarah Barr who's been working with us and is fabulous. So like just tapping into the resources we have within the community to be able to effectively um, engage more people, more get more and more people's experience uh, feedback on these issues. And then at the end, hopefully this is a living document so people can review and revise the process. And just to so give you an idea what this looks like, there are checklists like for the sponsors, what are existing issues or challenges you're addressing, what are the, who's gonna be impacted by it, define the purpose and goals, uh, what research and past consultant reports are, and these are all suggested. It's not like every memo has to include all of these things. And then once it comes to the council, they can talk about, is this measure a priority for council? Uh, I spoke with the town manager, what would be helpful to you in terms of giving feedback? Because it's hard for town staff and managers to say, no, we don't want to do it. But like asking them very specific questions, like what are the resources we will need? What is gonna cost the town? What is the timeline for the staff to work on this given their current priorities? So having these sort of questions in place allows all of the, as it's moving forward for the different people who are playing these roles to have certain questions to move it forward. And once it comes to the committee, then just deciding what is the level of involvement we want, community engagement we want, is a public comment enough or will we be needing more, um, more information? And the reason, again, to summarize why I think this is really important is because uh, we have been seeing a lot of burnout in town staff. There were a lot of proposals that are coming and there was no way of prioritizing them. Uh, like some of his sponsors were not really clear what was expected from us. And of course, one could say that we could have gone and found out and we, we tried, but it's very haphazard. Um, the town council needs a process still. We're still fairly new to how to prioritize new initiatives. And then we've been hearing from some of the town committees, hey, you're not utilizing our expertise. So this is to create a process of formally inviting our different like transportation advisory or energy and climate action committee or CSA, like inviting them to share the expertise in a particular format and then communicating back with them. And given our limited resources, how can we, like we're so stretched then <laughs> as counselors, like even now we have very few people who showed up because many people don't even know that we have district meetings. So how do we get the word out? How do we let people know, given our limited time, that, hey, we're talking about this and we need your feedback on 
you know, whether we're working on the nuisance pile or we're working on waste hauler or whatever it is. So, and my hope is that this can be used at the orientation for new town councils, uh, councillors. It can be a sponsor's reference when they're initiating. It can be used for facilitating discussions and collaborating. Can I give you back? So, any questions, feedback, comments? On that, like I guess for the re for for the community, of course, the fellow counselors and to be counselors, I am happy to, you know, use this opportunity to see your questions around this. Uh, but for the community and residents, I think the big question for you all is really how can we get the word out better, and how can we understand the lived experiences of people around issues that can then inform us as we are making decisions that impact you. Adrian. Oh, that's such an important question, Shalini. Uh, I don't have the million dollar answer. Mm -hmm. I think um, you've you've wrapped your arms around the issues that residents face, that your frustrations as a 13 member body have experienced and still struggle with. Uh, the fact is that a 13-member body is almost unable to reach out and put its arms around a, a full community. When I and, and I think it's up to the communities. Um, district five, as I mentioned, I I'm in the old District Five, but I had that's a political distinction. I feel very much a product of South Amherst. And until and unless we have communities reaching out to our 13 member bodies, because we are we're a small community, but we're very we're spread out politically mm -hmm. and geographically. And for me, it's no easy answer, but community building within the neighborhoods based mm -hmm. on the based on not the political or the redistricting, but for the affinity, how mm -hmm. to get there is another question. But I do feel very much a part of my neighborhood here in Orchard Valley, connected mm -hmm. a little bit larger to, you know, it's sort of like those mm -hmm. concentric circles. I'm part of Orchard Valley, I'm part of right. South Amherst. And then I'm very much a part of the town. So you've right. got all these concentric circles. I mm -hmm. think starting uh, starting at the, the the very center, it's sort of like your birth family and then going out mm -hmm. to the school family and the wider community. Again, mm -hmm. I, I should stop because I have no answers, but mm -hmm. in order to bridge what you so earnestly are seeking responses and answers for Shalini, and I have applauded you all along the way since I first heard of your plan is to reach into the neighborhoods. How uh, and how successful that might be, I don't know. Mm -hmm. Whether it's worth a try because your time is of such, uh, it's so de uh, high powered and demanded, I don't know. And no, I'm not asking for another task force, by the way. I think it's <laughs> <laughs> it's up to the, the uh, community the neighborhood communities, I think. Right. Yeah, no, I, I, you know, we, I, I do feel that acknowledging that we have limited time and we have limited staff, like our community participation officers are amazing and they are working on what they are working on, especially events in our town. And I think that's really important to build that sort of community that you're talking about, Adrian. It's not necessarily always about political things, but just getting to know our neighbors, whether it's the Juneteenth or like the South Asian or all these different festivals and stuff that we have having right now is really important. Um, but I think we have existing channels that are underutilized and that's kind of what I'm trying to see is what is a low hanging fruit. You know, just talking with Sarah Barr, I ran through, who's a, who's an Amherst College, she's like the liaison person for the town council with Amherst College. 
And I ran this by her and she was like, yeah, like we tell her this real synergy for the students on campus and the staff. And there's a lot of expertise in their community that is working on minimizing and creating a zero waste culture on campus. And so how do we create that synergy with Amherst College uh, expertise with our town? And then there's zero waste, of course, also that has done the, you know, they've done um, surveys, they have created neighborhood groups that when the time comes to go and educate people, because that's a big part of the zero waste uh, culture is education. You know, how do we min minimize our waste? How do we compost? Uh, how do we recycle, repurpose? All of those things. And so working with community partners is a very important part of uh, this list. And it's the purpose of this list is not to add to the counselor's responsibilities, but to streamline it and to make it easier. Like if I had known that I'm supposed to give a bylaw, I would have written it. I have written an amazing bylaw, which I'm so excited to share with you. So I've already sent it to, it's really fun once you know what is expected and there's that clarity, it's really amazing to, to be able to do what, you know, what we feel really passionate about. But for me, there's been a lack of clarity and it wasn't just me because when I spoke with Andy as an example, he's been in government for so long and he didn't have that, you know, he kept saying, why are we proposing a bylaw? Because we haven't yet decided. And the fact is we are expected to create a bylaw. So this document is meant to streamline and help the counselors to reduce some of the ambiguity and to use the current channels that we have um, and partnerships that we have. Any other questions from folks or comments? I'll save mine for, for TSO. Um, <laughs> okay, right. No, I'm just like, oh, hitting that 815 mark. Um, oh, uh, that's any true. other? Is it? 8.30, right? So I put it as 8.30, but I don't think we have that many questions, so we can definitely. Any um, other updates, Shalini or Bob? I think I've I've given my, George, you unmuted. Better be good. Thank you. Well, I just wanted to, yeah, thank you both for doing this. Um, yeah, it's, of course. I think for me, the one thing that I worry the most about is how I will communicate with a district that is so large and so diverse. Mm -hmm. um, I walked it for the last two months and it's big and it's got lots of different neighborhoods uh, yeah. and uh, each one has its own concerns and interests. And so I, something I give you a lot of thought to, and uh, this is certainly one vehicle um, mm -hmm. and there are others, but uh, yeah, trying to get people to, uh, trying to reach people and hear what they have to say is a real challenge. I felt that for three years on the council and I'm feeling it now as I look uh, ahead for the next two years in the new district three. And George, I would argue that your your reputation also precedes you. I've never been in your district, obviously, but your reputation as a communicator of um, what's going on on the council precedes mm -hmm. you. Your, your newsletters are legendary. As someone who's very, very bad at newsletters, um, I am in awe of, of what you can do there. <laughs> Please write mine for me. <laughs> um, they have a joint newsletter for sure. <laughs> yeah, Erica and then Alice. Um, yeah, I just, if we're wrapping up, I just wanted to take a minute to say how much we appreciate your service, Shalini. It's been mm -hmm. wonderful to have you representing uh, me, my family, my neighborhood, my district. Um, and Anna, thank you for continuing on. That's, a, <laughs> we know what a huge commitment this is and appreciate that you're willing to continue and kind of have that ongoing expertise um, and then Bob thank you for stepping up and we're you know it's great that you're willing to uh, mm -hmm. move from <laughs> finance into full <laughs> full power mode that's awesome um, so just to the three of you thank you for for a, like these and um, for your continued commitment to the public good thank you Erica thank you and, Erica uh, well you said can... thank you Erica so yeah. I repeat and say ditto thank you thank you one and all 
Um, on that note, Erica mm -hmm. mentioned something that I want to just toss out there, which is that with Bob cycling on to council, we will have an empty spot for a resident member of the finance committee. Uh -huh. um, so oh, the resident spot. please and keep that in mind. Um, if folks are interested, it's a pretty incredible way to um, to engage in the process and, mm -hmm. and learn how it works and all of that. So keep an eye out for that in January. And zoning board of appeals, please. I so say also one of the requests is please let your neighbors just send blanket emails to your neighbors that there are district meetings, introduce them to Bob and Anna, let, you know, just share their email addresses. I'm sure they don't mind getting that shared and so that they can jump on their email list and they can stay informed. And then of course, like Anna said, finance committee will have an MPM zoning board of appeals. We really, really need them. Those two are very important positions. So please okay. spread the word. And Alice. Alice. Yeah, well, I would start out by uh, um, echoing what Erica said, my appreciation for all the work that all of you have done and will do. Um, and I've been sitting here silent. And for some reason, I I thought, oh, well, there are other people who just haven't come forward. I mean, there are others that, that aren't, that I'm not seeing on the screen and then I looked to see and it said oh there are nine people participating <laughs> participating in this meeting and that mm -hmm. shook me up a bit and I thought well I can't be silent forever if I'm one of nine <laughs> <laughs> uh, and, and more than half of them are, are already on the council well they're not on the council right um, I've I've done my bit I'm not you know I've I've been the president of the residents council a resident association at Applewood and it's been a hell of a year and mm -hmm. I'm just going <laughs> off of it so uh, Thank you for that service. I'm now having a uh, health problem. Well, actually, my health problems are, are looking up. I have, I won't go into them, but I'm in good spirits now. But anyway, I, I, uh, I did today send it. Oh, well, I, I guess you know that there was no publicity about this until today. I mean, there had been a, a, a tiny little notice earlier in our precinct, um, which is basically, well, with the people here. Um, and so today I, I sent this, uh, I I sent Shalini's email to about 20 people at Applewood. And of course, none of them are here. Uh, but uh, I, 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 I guess, I mean, I was trying to think now, <coughs> what, how would I, I mean, I, I don't know how I would organize anything, but I'm more interested in getting together with people about something like you were talking about waste and, and mm -hmm. uh, recycling and things like that, that I participate in a, in a group at Applewood, or I did until mm -hmm. I was president, um, mm -hmm. about uh, sustainability and, and re recycling is the, the thing that we spend so much time on. Um, right. So in, in some, I mean, you don't need another issue, another thing to, to but, but um, that's just where my brain is going that, that, uh, people are, are uh, more interested in something specific rather than just saying, oh, well, how do you want to, what do you want to do with the town government or whatever? So, uh -huh. um, right. Uh, yeah. I think that's really helpful feedback, Alice. And I think, you know, Bob yeah. and I will have plenty of planning to do. And and one of the things on my agenda today that I didn't get to was reach out to Bob to talk about our strategy for district meetings. But I think one of the things that I'm hearing mm -hmm. from you, and, and I think based on our conversation today that could be helpful is, is say like, here are the two or three things that we're gonna talk about, but pull from, so for example, right now, you know, the council, we're, we're actually prepping carryover memos, right? Because we've only got a couple meetings left, but, um, but saying, all right, here, you know, right now in front of the council, we've got waste hauler and rental registration, come to the meetings, we're gonna bring the sponsors of those. I think mm -hmm. we, um, there's an opportunity for a bit more proactive planning on topic-based meetings yeah. um, versus general updates. I think where I struggle is that there's folks on so many, <laughs> so many awareness levels, right? Yeah. And, and how do we make sure that we're also staying approachable in the sense of giving that intro? But I think that that's something I, I think Bob and I can, and, and I know Shalini and I can um, kind of improvise a bit, right? To make sure that we give an intro if folks need it. Um, mm -hmm. But yeah, I think it's, it's helpful feedback to say, let's structure district meetings around a couple core issues versus just a blank um, slate. That makes sense. <laughs> But I can understand for this meeting that this was a, you know, a reasonable agenda. Um, I mean, there's always yeah. room for growth. Yeah, <laughs> yes. absolutely. There's, anyway, I do appreciate all the work yeah. that you guys do. 
Thank you. Yeah. Likewise. Yeah. But, uh, Likewise. But, you know, having been in town, I have to go back and re relitigate for previous discussion. I mean, I was in town meeting for years and years and years, and I really miss that opportunity to be in a group where you're doing something and, and voting mm. for the things you care about. And and I have mm. a difficult time even, I mean, I I just don't watch, I hate to admit this, I don't watch council meetings. What? Um, you know. <laughs> and so, um, you know, it's, I just feel so much re removed from from what uh -huh. we got with town meeting, although town meeting had its problems too, and we voted. I think that in particular, the modes of communication are really challenging um, and, and how we make sure that we're reaching people. And mm -hmm. I think that it's an area where there's a lot of opportunity for improvement. Um, yeah. yeah. And again, I think we're so stretched thin because we have job. Many of us oh, are yes. still working. And so I like the newsletter I did send. I don't know how it was before elections. I sent one and then today was a reminder email. But I did send one yeah. like many, I don't know, several weeks ago to yeah, mark your did. calendars. I I, yeah. yeah. So to mark the calendars. And that's kind of been the trend that we people have reduced more and more. So it's it's hard for us to be really energized also about setting an agenda and presenting. And I don't know, it's just, it is kind of hard. Um, but uh, Alice, what, what I'm hearing you say, and I'm wondering if like the newsletters can include that these are the topics that these committee, like committees are working. So if you're interested in waste hauler, for example, uh, there's gonna there's a huge carryover memo, and the next DSO is gonna be talking a lot about it, and we're gonna analyze the RFI because we did get three waste haulers to respond to oh, the RFIs. Wow. So that's very encouraging yes. news that there is interest because people are like, what if no, you know, only one person U.S. waste re responds, but we uh -huh. did get three. And so right now the town staff is analyzing the responses and in the carryover, I've presented the bylaw and the way it should be adopted. But then there's a decision table created with what are the questions for each, like to have an effective pay as you throw model. What are two options that I'm recommending based on best practices and then looking at the feasibility of that. So that, you know, if you're interested in that, you know, you the newsletters could let residents know that this TSO is working right now on waste hauler, blah, blah, blah. Yeah. The yeah. CRC, the carry forward is going to include the nuisance bylaw, for example, especially for residents with a lot of rental properties or just even owner owned properties where there's a lot of noise or, uh, you know, so that's being made more robust so that people feel they can enjoy the privacy of their homes and public spaces. So if someone's interested in nuisance bylaw, then they can come to the CRC meetings to discuss that. So maybe that's a good way to format the newsletters. And then also therefore the uh, district meetings can be around those issues. Yeah. I also think Alice, I think what I was hearing and is that it, there's a lot of committees and a lot of topics and that a district meeting provides an opportunity for a concentrated forum and space that isn't just a public comment and you know right. sitting through it, what can be a confusing meeting. So I think that there's, mm -hmm. I think, what I'm hearing you say is also really using the district meetings as that opportunity to dive into those topics more right. conversationally. Um, which right, I, like the library yeah. today. Yeah, yeah. we are, we're, um, Adrian, we're going to go to you and then we're nearly at time and I want to respect folks mm -hmm. uh, Thursday evenings, but Adrian? Yes. So I, I love this uh, discussion because if it's helpful to our counselors moving forward, mm -hmm. um, so I'm going to give an opposite point of view from my good friend, Alice. Uh, mm -hmm. There are some of us who watch you every Monday night that you have a meeting. There are many of us who also follow the finance committee meetings and the library trustees and school committees. So please consider this as you uh, talk about going forward. I, for one, am in favor of single issue district meetings. No more than two. Mm -hmm. I don't want to hear I, 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 a I big that, yes. of, of the town council and everything else, because honestly, you're tired of it and we're tired of hearing it. We're vitally interested in anything that affects us, both mm -hmm. in terms of the quality of the life of the resident and to make certain that we understand 
the decisions mm-hmm. that town council's making. And if we don't understand it, then this is where I see an opportunity to ask you questions. Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. thank you for making your time available. And um, I'm going to stop there. I wish you all well. Um, don't worry about the nine of us. That's a very few. Yes, there were some communication <laughs> problems, but it's almost December and everybody's thinking about the holidays. So let me end by saying happy holidays. Uh, I'm going to invite everyone to the markers, friends and uh, friends and neighbors. We have an annual tree lighting down mm-hmm. here at Marcus Pond. George, are you still listening? I spoke to you about our issues with our beautiful conservation area. So you're going to get a special personal invite. So good night, everybody. <laughs> Thank you so much. And George when is that? First, they repair Mercred's Pond. Adrian, when is the Marcus Pond gathering? Oh, I'll send it to you too, Shani. Okay. So okay. We have a Thank date. It's December 11th, but I will send that out. It's grown a little bit over the years. That's We've awesome. only had a, sort of a very small group that shows mm-hmm. up, but um, I will send out that invite to you all, okay? Thank so please you. come down. Thank we'll have some you. hot cider and some cookies and uh, neighbors. <laughs> and if Alice, you want to get come your on down. Of- <laughs> if you want to get your fill of tree lightings um, tomorrow, weather dependent, yes. um, we yes. have the very Merry Maple currently in my office, which is across from it. And I'm going to give you a quick spoiler, which is that they accidentally plugged it in last week and it looks really good. And then they quickly uh, unplugged it. So uh, I, six. I got a quick preview of it when they were like, whoops. Um, so please come out tomorrow. It's from three to six. Uh, if it's pouring rain, they won't do it. But uh, otherwise, please come come join us. My girlfriend mm-hmm. has requested that we bring uh, the dog. So my, there might be a poodle sighting as well, which I'm a little anxious. About. <laughs> we'll be fine. Um, thank you all so, you, so you, much. Where, where, where is this last that you were talking about? The so Mary Maple. Um, oh, is Mary on the, Maple. Yeah, Mary on, the, on the town common. Yeah. Yep. Um, and on the southern end of it. Opposite Boldwood. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yes. Great. All right. Thank you all so all much. Right. Uh, thank you so happy much. Happy, happy holidays. Yes. Bye. Thank you. Thank you, so thank you. Thank you. Ken and George and Bob, thank you especially for coming. We really appreciate your your input. Thank you. Our pleasure. Thank yeah. you. Thank you, Ken, for all the work you're doing. Thank you yeah. very much. Take care. Thank you. Have a good night, everybody. Bye. Good night. All right.